Hi, this is Nicholas Hatcher, and in this lecture we will discuss oxygenation and perfusion. Objectives for this lecture include the following. Explore the relationship between the physiology and pathophysiology of oxygenation and perfusion. Conceptualize cardiopulmonary processes in terms of three key alterations, including ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. Develop assessment skills and techniques aimed at the three key alterations. Apply key diagnoses to the underlying alterations in ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. Defend cardiopulmonary interventions with appropriate evidence-based rationales. And finally, evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. The cardiovascular and pulmonary system work together to meet metabolic demands by making an exchange with the gases in the air, with the gases in the body, and then delivering those gases to tissues. By doing this, a dynamic equilibrium or changing balance is achieved between oxygen supply and demand. So why exactly do we need oxygen? For the following physiology and pathophysiology, just relax and listen. This content will not be on the exam, but will give you an idea of the importance of oxygen. I'm sure you can recall from anatomy and physiology the discussion on cellular respiration. During this process, we break down glucose through a series of steps ultimately resulting in ATP formation. During the final step, the electron transport chain, we synthesize the highest yield of adenosine triphosphate. As you move through each complex in the chain, a concentration gradient of hydrogen ions develops on one side of the mitochondrial membrane. Oxygen is then required to accept the final electron at the end of the chain. If oxygen is absent here, we would not be able to perform aerobic metabolism. Without oxygen, the mitochondrial membrane is altered. 70% of all of our ATP synthesized is used to maintain pumps, for example, the sodium-potassium pump. Because we no longer have aerobic metabolism, and thereby less ATP, sodium-potassium pumps are altered, and we eventually convert to anaerobic glycolysis. Because oxygen is no longer available to accept the last electron in the electron transport chain, there's a buildup of hydrogen ions within the mitochondrion. This results in an acidic environment that ultimately disrupts the stability of the mitochondrial membrane. Because there's a lack of ATP, the sodium-potassium pumps fail to maintain the concentration of sodium and potassium inside and outside the cell. The result of this is the movement of sodium into the cell. Where sodium goes, water follows. This results in swelling of the cell and ultimately rupture of the cell. Expand this concept and you can imagine the damage that a lack of oxygen can have on the body. Because pyruvate can no longer enter aerobic metabolism, it is converted to lactic acid. Lactic acid can sustain energy needs for a very short period of time. However, if oxygen is not restored, lactic acid accumulates and severe multi-system damage can ensue. So the net result of a lack of oxygen is swollen cells that ultimately rupture, a lack of ATP, and an acidic environment. The key concept here is that organ or organ system problems are simply amplified versions of cellular problems. Now let's take a look at the bigger picture and discuss which organs are involved in oxygenation and perfusion. Here's a sketch to help you recall the anatomy of involved organs. In short, adequate oxygenation and perfusion requires adequately functioning lungs, heart, blood vessels, nervous system, and musculoskeletal system. The primary function of the lungs is oxygenation. The lungs make an exchange with what's in the air and what's in the blood. This includes the processes of ventilation and diffusion. The primary function of the cardiovascular system is perfusion. This involves the movement of blood into and out of capillary beds of the lungs to body organs and tissues. I've organized the content of your textbook into three key interrelated cardiopulmonary processes. These three processes are ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. Ventilation involves the airways, the lung tissue, the musculoskeletal system, and nervous system. Diffusion involves the alveoli, and perfusion involves the heart and the vasculature. 
A good place to start is always with a good assessment of your patient. Be sure to elicit a history of your patient's usual breathing pattern and assess for any changes. Additionally, explore the patient's history for any factors that may contribute to altered cardiopulmonary function. Let's now discuss alterations in cardiopulmonary function. Here is a visual representation of the three key cardiopulmonary processes and their associated nursing diagnosis or diagnoses. For the remainder of the lecture, we will explore each of the key processes, that is, ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion, and then we will go into some detail regarding their associated diagnoses and how to manage problems in these areas. I have intentionally rearranged the content from the textbook in order to construct a more logical flow. We will begin with impaired ventilation. Ventilation is the movement of air into and out of the lungs. For this to work properly, you need an intact airway, nervous system, musculoskeletal system, and bellows. By that, I'm referring to the lungs. Nursing diagnoses that fall into this category include ineffective airway clearance and ineffective breathing pattern. Ineffective airway clearance is a state in which a patient experiences an inability to clear secretions or obstructions from the respiratory tract to maintain a clear airway. Defining characteristics of this diagnosis is ineffective or absent cough reflex and an inability to remove airway secretions. Goals for these patients include not experiencing aspiration as evidenced by demonstration of an effective cough reflex or demonstration of increased air exchange. Here I've listed the interventions for this diagnosis. We will discuss each of them in more detail. To develop support for this nursing diagnosis, be sure to explore details regarding the characteristics of the patient's cough and sputum. When thinking about hydration, I like to imagine Jell-O as a representation of the effect of hydration. Jell-O packets are essentially filled with protein. When the correct amount of water is added, Jell-O becomes a thick solution after allowing the water to bind with the protein. This same concept occurs with sputum. Mucus is relatively proteinaceous, and a small amount of water maintains a thick consistency. Just like adding too much water results in jello that is too liquid, hydrating an individual will thin secretions. Individuals who might need more hydration include those with a fever, mouth breathers, or coughing, as this leads to an excess excretion of uh, fluids. Individuals who need less fluid include those with heart failure, and low sodium. Normally, aerosols, gases, and particulates stimulate the irritant receptors in the lungs, resulting in a cough. This may be reduced if the patient's experiencing pain or there's an ineffective reflex. In these cases, you may need to train your patients to voluntarily cough. Coughing is especially beneficial prior to meals and at bedtime. These are examples of cough medications. In general, you want to know whether or not the patient has a productive cough prior to administering these meds. For a congested patient, an expectorant such as guafenicin is indicated. For the non-congested patient, a cough suppressant or lozenge is indicated. Chest physiotherapy includes a group of interventions that promote secretion movement and clearance. These interventions include percussion, vibration, and postural drainage. This image shows positions for postural drainage and is similar to the one in your textbook. However, this image shows the particular area of the lung that the position targets. In airway obstruction, you may notice an inspiratory wheeze, a weak cough, distress, cyanosis, which is a color change to blue, and the universal choking sign. To clear a partial obstruction, encourage the patient to cough. In order to clear a complete obstruction, you may have to perform the Heimlich maneuver or abdominal thrust. Individuals with obstructive sleep apnea, obesity hypoventilation syndrome, and heart failure may require positive airway pressure to keep the airway open. Continuous positive airway pressure works by continually introducing pressure to maintain an open oro and nasopharynx in order to prevent obstruction. Artificial airways are inserted into the mouth or nose in order to maintain an open airway while providing bag valve mask ventilation.
I will discuss bag valve mask ventilation in another slide. There are different sizes for artificial airways, and when determining the size, you want to find one that fits similarly to how the picture demonstrates from mouth to jaw. If the airway cannot be managed by clearing secretions or other less invasive means, the patient may require intubation. Endotracheal intubation is a last resort for establishing an airway. During intubation, a flexible tube called an endotracheal tube is inserted into the trachea, assisted by the use of a blunted blade to maneuver the airway. It's important to note that these patients cannot manage secretions, so suctioning is often required. This procedure is only within the scope of practice of a physician, nurse practitioner, or CRNA. Later in the program, we will go into more detail regarding intubation and mechanical ventilation. Suctioning is indicated when there's excessive saliva, blood, pulmonary secretions, vomitus, or foreign material in the airway. Problems that may arise with suctioning include mucosal irritation, hypoxia, infection, and arrhythmias. During suctioning, you want to use personal protective equipment as well as cardiac monitoring to watch for arrhythmias. Monitor the patient's heart rate, skin coloration, and the color, consistency, and amount of secretions. A general rule of thumb for patients requiring suctioning who have an ET tube in place is to suction no longer than 10 seconds. Another nursing diagnosis for the patient with impaired ventilation is ineffective breathing pattern. This is defined as inspiration and or expiration that does not provide adequate ventilation. There are many defining characteristics for this diagnosis, including the ones I've listed for you here. The goal for this diagnosis is that the patient will achieve improved respiratory function as evidenced by demonstration of respiratory rate within normal limits compared with baseline, expressing relief or improvement in the feelings of dyspnea or shortness of breath, and relating causative factors and ways of preventing or managing them. You may recall studying lung volumes and capacities in anatomy and physiology. The way we get these values is through pulmonary function testing. In pulmonary function testing, the patient breathes into a spirometer and values are obtained regarding the volumes and capacities. Here's a reminder of the lung volumes and capacities. You will not be expected to recall these for exam purposes. Additional data provided by pulmonary function testing is information regarding the efficacy of inspiration and expiration. This is called a flow volume loop and is constructed by the patient inspiring and expiring. It shows the flow of oxygen during inspiration below the x-axis and then during expiration following up the y-axis and then back across the x-axis. The flow volume loop additionally shows the volume of expiration Overall, the flow volume loop provides information about obstructive diseases and restrictive diseases. Interventions for ineffective breathing pattern include positioning, deep breathing, pursed lip breathing, abdominal or diaphragmatic breathing, and incentive spirometry. A straight and upright position, also known as high Fowler's positioning, allows free movement of the diaphragm and expansion of the chest wall. This results in ease of ventilation. Prone positioning improves oxygenation by removing the pressure of abdominal or thoracic contents on the lungs. Whenever an individual is in a slumped posture, abdominal contents press upward on the diaphragm, resulting in a decrease in your tidal volume. Deep breathing can be used to overcome hypoventilation. Instruct the patient to take deep breaths enough to move the bottom ribs. You also want to instruct the patient to inhale through their nose and exhale through their mouth. Pursed lip breathing functions to slow and prolong expiration and may reduce derecruitment or collapse of the alveoli, resulting in improved gas exchange and decreased dyspnea. It also helps to control the rate and depth of breathing. It's indicated for dyspnea, fear, and panic. Abdominal or diaphragmatic breathing changes from upper chest breathing to breathing with the abdomen. It functions to decrease ventilatory rate, increase alveolar ventilation, and expel larger amounts of gas. When using incentive spirometry, you'll want to have the patient inspire about 10 times an hour while awake 
This will reinforce deep breathing, assist in slow and deep inspiration, prevent or decrease atelectasis, which is derecruitment of the alveoli or collapse of the alveoli. It optimizes gas exchange and also increases secretion clearance. The bag valve mask or AMBU bag is used to provide ventilation to the patient when the patient's ventilations are too slow, weak, or absent. For this technique, you'll want to tilt the head back, pull the jaw forward, and use what's called the CE hold. Form a C by using your thumb and index finger around the device. The remaining fingers make an E on the jaw. You'll want to deliver 16 to 20 breaths per minute and this device also attaches to an existing endotracheal tube or tracheostomy tube. Mechanical ventilation provides machine-assisted breaths for the patient with inadequate ventilation. This machine is attached to an endotracheal tube, a nasotracheal tube, or a tracheostomy tube. The variables on the machine can be changed to deliver specific volumes, pressures, ventilatory rate, and oxygen. Next, we will look at problems of impaired diffusion. Diffusion is the movement of gases between the air spaces in the lungs and the bloodstream. In order to have adequate diffusion, you need a functionally adequate alveolus at an appropriate distance from a nearby vessel, adequate blood flow in that vessel, with an adequate amount of hemoglobin. Oxygen is transported in two forms, dissolved in fluid or combined with hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is essential to the reception and distribution of oxygen. When bound to oxygen, hemoglobin is referred to as oxyhemoglobin. This becomes important when thinking about the movement of oxygen in the system. This curve is referred to as the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. This can be used to conceptualize how the SAO2, also known as the oxygen saturation or SpO2, relates to the PaO2 or the partial pressure of oxygen in an arterial blood gas sample. Align the patient's SpO2, or oxygen saturation, with the PaO2 that intersects. For example, if your oxygen saturation is 90%, then your PaO2 is about 60 millimeters of mercury. You'll notice that the curve almost plateaus above 90%. This finding suggests that administering higher concentrations of oxygen will not increase the oxygen saturation much, primarily because most of your hemoglobin are fully saturated with oxygen. There is much more that can be derived from this conceptual model, but it's beyond the scope of this lecture. It is important to note that the SAO2 is from an arterial blood gas sample, whereas the oxygen saturation, or SpO2, is an estimate of the SAO2 obtained from a pulse ox. Therefore, the SpO2 may not reflect the precise SAO2. The nursing diagnosis for impaired diffusion is impaired gas exchange. This is defined as an excess or deficit in oxygenation and or carbon dioxide elimination at the alveolar capillary membrane. Defining characteristics of this diagnosis include an abnormal ABG, which includes an abnormal pH, hypercapnia or high CO2, hypocapnia or low CO2, or hypoxemia, which is low oxygen in the blood. Also, abnormal breathing pattern, abnormal skin color, altered mental status, dyspnea, tachycardia, and anemia are defining characteristics of this diagnosis. A good way to assess diffusion is through pulse oximetry. This is a non-invasive measurement of arterial oxyhemoglobin saturation. This reflects a ratio expressed as a percentage between the actual oxygen content of hemoglobin and the potential maximum oxygen carrying capacity of hemoglobin. Desaturation indicates a gas exchange abnormality, and typically we use the cutoff of less than 90%. In some more advanced monitoring equipment, you will see a wave referred to as a pleth wave if the pleth wave does not show hills and valleys of adequate size, the oxygen saturation may be inadequate. In some settings, capnography is used to measure the carbon dioxide to determine the adequacy of ventilation. Don't memorize the different waveforms. I provided them to you as a reference.
We briefly discussed ABG values in the lab and diagnostic lecture. Just know that these values are a reflection of diffusion. Additionally, the CBC provides information about the adequacy and quantity of hemoglobin. Before we discuss methods for providing supplemental oxygen, I want you to recognize that oxygen is a drug and you should use it with caution. Equate giving oxygen to giving any other drug. Only use what is necessary to correct the imbalance. Giving oxygen is indicated for an oxygen saturation of less than 90%. Problems that can arise from giving oxygen include oxidative stress and nitrogen washout, which we'll discuss further. Oxygen loves to hook up with anyone in the near environment. When oxygen binds with one electron, it becomes superoxide. If it binds to another electron, it becomes hydrogen peroxide. If it binds to another, it becomes a hydroxyl free radical. Ultimately, it may become water. Superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, and hydroxyl are all free radicals referred to as oxidants. Ultimately, this buildup of oxidants overcomes the existing antioxidants in the body. When this happens, the free radicals build up in the mitochondria and cause damage to the mitochondrial membrane as well as the mitochondrial DNA ultimately resulting in a decrease in your ATP production. A bigger problem is nitrogen washout. A balance of three gases exists in the lungs, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. Nitrogen helps to keep the alveoli open and expanded, along with surfactant. Because oxygen weighs more than nitrogen, it easily takes the place of nitrogen in the alveoli. Without nitrogen, atelectasis or the collapse of alveoli occurs. When this happens, you can no longer exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide in that alveolus. Now let's discuss providing supplemental oxygen. The oxygen flow rate is measured in liters per minute or LPM. Precautions that should be taken when providing supplemental oxygen include avoiding open flames, using no smoking signs, because oxygen is a combustible gas, checking electrical equipment, avoiding synthetic fibers, and avoiding oils. Humidity can be used when higher delivery rates are used to prevent drying of the mucosa. Delivery systems that will cover include the nasal cannula and face masks. Advantages of using a nasal cannula include that the patient can still eat and speak and also you can add humidification. Disadvantages of the nasal cannula include that it can dislodge easily and it can dry the nasal mucosa. Some feel that mouth breathers do not receive as much oxygen from a nasal cannula compared to nose breathers. This may not be true as the act of inhalation changes the pressure gradient in the lungs resulting in a pulling force that pulls gases from the environment into the lungs. However, it's important to correlate this with the patient's response to therapy. The nasal cannula flow rate in liters per minute is often documented as the fractional excretion of oxygen or FiO2. Some individuals document this as a percentage, but the most appropriate way to document it is with a decimal. On the nasal cannula, an individual can only go as high as 6 liters per minute with an FiO2 of 0.44 or 44%. The next step is a simple face mask, which delivers 6 to 8 liters per minute. The face mask has vents on the side that dilute and exchange carbon dioxide. It increases oxygen delivery for short periods of time. It's important to never use less than 5 liters per minute, as this will lead to carbon dioxide retention. The partial rebreather is like the simple face mask, but with a bag. It delivers 8 to 11 liters per minute. With the partial rebreather, exhaled air is mixed with 100% oxygen. Thus, you rebreathe a third of expired air from the reservoir bag. The bag should only deflate slightly. If it were to completely collapse, you need to increase the liters per minute. The non-rebreather gives the highest concentration of oxygen to a spontaneously breathing patient. 
The non-rebreather has two one-way valves that prevent the patient from rebreathing expired air, hence the term non-rebreather. The Venturi mask delivers the most precise oxygen concentration. This is based on the Venturi principle, which states that as the tube narrows, pressure drops, causing air to be pulled in through side ports. You want to be sure that the ports are always open. Obstruction by linens, clothes, etc. can result in an increase or decrease in oxygen concentration. Finally, mechanical ventilation can help with diffusion by administering a precise amount of oxygen as well as controlling other variables of oxygen delivery. The third and final problem we'll discuss is impaired perfusion. Remember that the primary function of the cardiovascular system is perfusion, which involves the movement of blood into and out of the capillary beds of the lungs to body organs and tissues. Examples of altered perfusion include inadequate pumping from the heart, problems with the vessel, problems with the red blood cell or hemoglobin, problems with the distance between the vessel and the tissue, and problems with the volume in the vessel. The nursing diagnosis decreased cardiac output is defined as inadequate blood pumped by the heart to meet metabolic demands of the body. Defining characteristics of this diagnosis include altered heart rate, altered preload, which is the volume that fills the heart, altered contractility, which is the pumping action of the heart, altered afterload, which has to do with the constriction of the vessels, and behavioral or emotional factors. Your assessment of the patient should include a history of symptoms, including chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea, which is shortness of breath associated with certain physicians, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, or awakening in the middle of the night finding it difficult to breathe, palpitations, edema, and anxiety. It should also include a history of conditions such as heart failure, myocardial infarction, infection, and anaphylaxis. Your key vital sign is heart rate, and you'll want to note whether there's tachycardia or bradycardia. In your physical exam, pay special attention to elevated JVP, or jugular venous pressure or distension, as well as extra heart sounds or murmurs. Labs and diagnostics that can be considered for this diagnosis include the troponin, the CKMB, the brain naturetic peptide, an electrocardiogram, and an echocardiogram. The electrocardiogram provides information about the electrical activity of the heart. It can help you determine the rate and rhythm of conduction as well as specific locations of ensuing damage. The echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart that provides information about the valves, the ventricles, and the atria. The following is an excellent visual representation of general interventions for this nursing diagnosis. You are not expected to memorize these. In general, to provide adequate cardiac output, you need to have enough fluid to pump, you need an adequate squeeze, and you need patent vessels that are not too tight and not too loose. The last nursing diagnosis associated with perfusion is ineffective tissue perfusion. This is defined as a decrease in oxygen resulting in failure to nourish the tissues at the capillary level. There are many subcategories of this diagnosis that involve particular organs. The key problem here is something referred to as ischemia or lack of blood flow. When assessing these patients, you'll want to note a history of infection, anaphylaxis, or spinal cord injury. Often this diagnosis involves shock syndromes. You'll also want to check the patient for history of uh, cardiopulmonary diseases, including heart failure and COPD. Vital signs for these patients may fluctuate. Physical exam findings are often systemic, and you'll definitely want to check pulses and skin integrity. Labs and diagnostics associated with this nursing diagnosis include lactic acid, brain naturetic peptide, the BUN and serum creatinine, and the CBC, especially white blood cells and hemoglobin and hematocrit. Other diagnostics include the head CT, invasive hemodynamic monitoring, etc. To summarize, there are three key cardiopulmonary processes 
ventilation, diffusion, and perfusion. Nursing diagnoses for ventilation include ineffective airway clearance and ineffective breathing pattern. The nursing diagnosis for diffusion is impaired gas exchange. Nursing diagnoses for perfusion include decreased cardiac output and ineffective tissue perfusion. I have posted a supplemental handout that summarizes this content. I hope you enjoyed the content and good luck studying for your exam next week.